Craig Newbold spent 10 years working at Jane Street Capital, one of the most prestigious quant trading firms in the world. This podcast is jam-packed with value as Craig and I discuss the skills that traders need to be building in order to be competitive in the market and the opportunities that exist for retail traders to find an edge in the market over the hedge funds and other competitors in the space. It's amazing that Craig came on and shared all this alpha with us. So with that being said, let's hop into the podcast and hear from Craig himself. So yeah, my, my path was always uh, a bit of a weird one. I'm going to try and keep this to the brief version so I, I don't send everyone to sleep. Uh, but yeah, I sort of you know grew up interested in a whole load of things, heavily biased towards, let's say, science very broadly. Uh, and then later on, you know, got more into mathematics. So at university, uh, I studied mathematics, uh, but spent a lot of time dabbling in a lot of other stuff, uh, you know, electronics, radio, uh, you know, computer stuff, uh, even some computer security stuff. Uh, and honestly, I thought I was on the path to be an academic. You know, like the, the idea of industry in general or, or trading in particular really wasn't on my mind there. Right? I thought I knew what I wanted to do. Um, so in the spirit of trying more, you know, I thought, well, if I'm gonna go on to become an academic afterwards, I should do an internship in industry now and actually ended up, you know, sort of trying to look around, uh, apply to a bunch of places, being pretty systematic. And, uh, you know, I, I applied to a whole load of places. Some were uh, software, some were hardware. You know, there, there's some very varied range of stuff I might have been doing. And a couple of them uh, were trading firms, uh, one of which was Jane Street. And honestly, like, even at that point, I. You know, it wasn't I wanted to be a trader. It was, this seems like a really interesting thing to do. You know, these seem like interesting people, smart people. Their problems seem interesting. Let, let's dive into that. And uh, yeah, I guess I, I actually really enjoyed the internship. Mm-hmm. You know, it, and I think in particular, what really grabbed me about trading was how much there is to it. Like, it, it is in some ways a very pure discipline because. You know, your job isn't to try and do one particular thing. Your job's never, I want to make money by doing X. You know, your job is, I want to do good trades. You know, I want to find any way I can to do that. Uh, and so, yeah, so I actually ended up coming back uh, a few times. Uh, and uh, in, in some sense, the, the rest became history. Like in the end, I actually decided I was not going to stay on and, uh, and be an academic. Um, yeah, that's um, that's a cool transition. So let's back up there for a second. Yeah. When you first applied at a trading firm, had you had any previous interest in finance at all? Uh, in terms of traditional finance, not really. Like, I guess I, you know, I, get, I didn't really have any money at the time. So it's not like I really had anything which might be termed, you know, investments. You know, I'm mm-hmm. a student just come out of high school. Yeah, no, what do you expect? Uh but, you know, I was trying to understand it, understand, like, how the world worked, sort of start to take an interest in, in I guess, managing, you know, managing what I was doing with what little I had and maybe where I would be later. But, you know, almost as a hobby. Yeah, that's, a, that's really interesting because I, I feel like, um, so for example, for myself, part of how I got into this space was you know, my parents had investments and stuff. And then Mm. I started to look at it. And so I grew up in Canada. And when the whole uh, marijuana legalization thing was going Mm. on, everybody was buying these stocks, right? So that was sort of like my first taste of, man, maybe I should set up an account here and try to figure it out, right? I had this very like innocent, like, let's get our feet wet here, you know, let's go figure it out uh, type of approach. But it's, it's interesting to hear that you actually came from a different side where it almost sounds like you had built up a skill set that put you in a spot that all these like sort of doors were peeking open now. And one of those doors yeah. happened to be trading. Yeah. And, and I think probably the, the biggest thing about it is it lets you use so much, you know, like I'm very much a generalist and I get to use so much of that in trading. That there's what, what just so many. So, you know, I, I guess this is maybe, you know, starting to, to step forward into the rest of my career. Uh-huh. Uh, but in my time there, I've done everything from, you know, kind of manual trading, like 
while the world's going crazy, while we're in the heap of a crisis, you know, you're never going to have a computer pre-prepared for every eventuality. You've just got to do what you can, you know, with with, with your wits effectively uh, and what you know. Uh, I've done you know, a bunch of stuff in terms of monitoring. I've spent a lot of time writing, you know, writing software for, for various of the trading systems or various tools to help with the trading. You know, I, I've done research along the way. You know, I even had the excuse to to try out some of the more modern deep learning uh, methods, mm. uh, you know, directly on trading problems. And you know, I, I, I have opinions on that, which I suspect will come up later. Oh, 100%. Uh, yeah, you just, we're going to dive into that for sure. <laughs> but yeah, you just get to use so much, you know, like it, it's a fascinatingly varied field. Yeah, that, that that's brilliant. I, I actually agree with it as well. Um, You know, I, I think there's definitely a fundamental set of skills you need to be able to compete in the game. But then it's your expertise in other areas that actually help you find mm -hmm. some sort of edge. Right. Yeah. So like, a general example would be, if you are an M&A lawyer, you might know more about that yeah. than the another person and you can actually directly apply skills from your other profession into the world of trading. Right? And yeah. potentially find some alpha there, you know, looking in areas yeah, where um, other people have less skill. Yeah, I very much agree, Sean. Like, yeah, and I, I think that I, I would actually agree with you. I think that's the best part about trading is the the creativity element and the the fact that there is a, um, so much you can do, right? There's so many yeah. unique little opportunities that people can find. You know, uh, ones that friends have told me about, for example, are just, you know, I'm like, how did you come up with this? You know, <laughs> like, I can't believe it. Um, but yeah. I, I think that that's the real beauty of the game. It's not, you know, what you know, like at a basic level of people thinking like sitting in front of the charts all day and, you know, this it's, it's going out yeah. there to solve these real problems. And then yeah. if you're correct, you get paid for solving it. Yeah. That's the very and, cool part. Uh, yeah. And I think building on that, uh, Sean, actually one of the things I think is really cool is it's in some sense a very honest profession. Like almost every business in the world, the way the business makes its money is selling something to someone. In, in aid of that, it makes a product, it tries to make a good product, but at the end of the day, it gets no money if it sells nothing. You know, if it mm -hmm. had a terrible product, but amazing marketing, it might still do great as a business. Trading, prop trading just isn't like that. You, know, you, mm -hmm. you don't make money by convincing people you're right or you're smart. You make money by doing things. Yeah, I, I, I love that. It's like, it's almost more of a, like a trade. You know, you get paid yeah. for going out and doing the work. And if you do good yeah. work, you get paid. <laughs> yeah. And okay. if you do bad work, you're going to pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. But it, it's, a, it's definitely a, a very competitive game as well. And, what, what, you know, maybe before we, we, we jump ahead too much, what, why don't you share a little bit about uh, what your actual responsibilities were at Jane Street, the different roles you held? You know, you touched on a bit, you did some manual trading, things like that. But, yeah. you know, what sort of departments were you in? What was your day to day like? Yeah, uh, so it's very hard to condense the, the sort of more or less eight years. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've worked there in three different continents uh, across a, a huge range of roles within the firm, actually. So uh, Jane Street isn't very big on, on job titles or such. So there's no, you know, nice formal, oh, now you're such and such title in, in such and such role. Uh, and I always tended to actually work with quite a few different groups, you know, like I think there was a lot of valuable stuff to be found, you know, kind of by bringing people together or, or looking for the gaps. Uh, but, but to briefly summarize, yeah, I think I, I spent most of my time as some sort of hybrid trader slash researcher slash quant, hmm. um, you, you know, kind of working I guess full, you know, to, to use the term from the software development industry, arguably full stack would, would be pretty applicable. Cool. Um, and yeah, within that, I've worked on, you know, equities, equity derivatives, uh, options, uh, you know, ETFs, futures. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, wow. I, I think possibly fixed income are like some of the only products I didn't spend time working on in my time back. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. Was there any department you were in that you like uh, really felt at home in? One, one that you thought like, this is the spot that I'm more happy than anywhere else to be? Uh, 
Honestly, not really. And I think part of that, and this maybe comes to a piece of advice I might give to, to people mm -hmm. looking for firms, don't over-focus on the product. You know, the, like, this will vary between firms, but so many things are more important than, than the specific product you, you're going to be trading. And there are just so many transferable skills that, that for example, I would definitely say, you know, find somewhere you can work with people you're excited to work with on like any product in preference to, you know, your favorite product, but mm -hmm. somewhere you're less excited. But well, one thing that would go without saying there though is you have to know your product, right? Yep. Although I, would you agree? So I think that depends a lot on what type of trading you're doing. You know, there, mm -hmm. there is trading which is relatively specific to your know, particular product. And there are details that matter. You know, if you're if you're going to trade fixed income products, you need to understand yield curves. You know, if you're going to trade commodities, you need to understand, you know, contango, backwardation, storage costs. You know, if you're going to trade options, you need to understand vol. But I actually think the basics of trading are such a large fraction of you know of what's going on that you you can actually learn a lot of the details. And if you're, if especially if you're able to work with someone, you know, like another thing about trading is it's, I think it's an industry that benefits a lot from kind of apprenticeships, uh, essentially. Um, and, and I realize that that can sometimes be a challenge how to sort of get there. But, you know, there's, th there's a lot of core skills that matter and you need to know the product. It might be your unique edge is that you know a lot about one product that no one else does. Uh, but you know there are a lot of places for which products are products. You know, at the end of the day, there are people trading things. You know, and at least as Jane Street thought about it, you know, we we provide liquidity. We look for ways in which people demand liquidity, and you know, find ways to provide it to them. And that's actually pretty product agnostic. That's really interesting. I so you said something there which I want to dig a little deeper on, which is that, you know, the product knowledge is one thing, but there's these general trading principles that you think yeah. sort of overarc everything and really take precedence when it comes to turning trading into a career. Yeah. And I would agree with you on this because, you know, if you boil a trade down to what it really is, it's, it's not an option. It's not a stock. It's not, you know, this phone it's, <laughs> Right. Anything can be traded. Right. And so is that sort of what you're alluding to with that comment or yeah. so, what, what sort of principles do you think? Uh, was there any that you learned that were like a light bulb moment that things got really interesting once you once you understood? Yeah. So so I think there was maybe less of a light bulb moment of like suddenly learning and more of like some vague intuitions I'd had previously. And it's finally like, oh, wow, you know, I. I found people who can think this way as well. Uh, but, but the kind of number one, one and a half, uh, like understand what, what the competition is, understand what the threshold for, for being right is, or to say it a different way, understand what your edge is. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter if you have an amazing model, if everyone else in the room has a better one, you know, you're not mm. gonna make money. Or it doesn't matter if your model's crap, if it's because some wild events just happened in the world and everyone's models are completely useless and yours is like very slightly less crap, <laughs> then you're gonna make loads of money. And, and really understanding that at a deep level is key. I couldn't have said it better myself. Like I 100% agree. Something that I always tell uh, you know the members of Pretty Alpha is uh, it's trading is a competition, not a test. You're not going to get paid yes. for checking off a box. If everybody else got an A and you got an A minus, you're not going to get paid. You know, you need yeah. to get the A plus then, right? So you got to be better than the next guy. As much as it's about being smart and it's about, you know, caring and trying hard, you need to always push. That, that's why people always push for more and try to get better because, yeah. uh, you know, just like any good marketplace, it's a competition. Right? And that's what drives all the efficiency and, and makes it such a, an interesting game to be a part of. I wanted to ask you about this because um, we're, we're basically at this point where uh, let's start off with this fundamental skills that you think a trader should have retail or professional. Yeah. What would you say that if you're like, if you are actually serious about this game and you're spending, let's say 15 plus hours a week on it, 
Yeah. We'll, we'll call that being serious about it. Sure. Where should you be spending your time as, in your opinion, as a beginner or an intermediate or even an expert level uh, trader in terms of proficiency? Yeah. That's a great question, Sean. Uh, Thanks. So I guess starting, starting at the beginner level, I would basically say internalizing this idea you know, that we've just talked about of like that it is a competition and explicitly thinking in terms of what do other people know? Why are other people doing what they're doing? You know, like given the fact I've been able to do this trade, what does that say about the world's beliefs? And I'd say that's probably the, yeah, the kind of biggest hurdle that moves you from a position of, you know, you might make money if you're lucky, but I, I'm, you know, I don't think you're in a stable trading position through to you're going to find a way to make some money. Because of course the flip side of that coin is that you don't have to be better than everyone at everything. You just have to like find some little chink, some tiny little corner of the world where you do have edge. And as long as you're thoughtful about, you know, making sure you're trading when you're using that edge and not when you're not, you know, you, you can make money without having to, you know, outcompete the, the Jane Streets, the, the Citadels, yeah. the Susquehannas of the world with giant, you know, quant teams. So that, and then just being comfortable with uncertainty, like having a good intuitive understanding of what kind of, uh, you know, what sort of uncertainty and probability is. Like, how confident are you? Uh, one of the interview questions I, I used to ask was, you know, uh, basically an estimation question, but I was very interested in how, you know, how confident people were in their answer and where their confidence interval was. Uh, and, you know, this wasn't like a binary pass fail test, like, spoiler, basically nobody is like good at that from cold. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, oh, no, you, you weren't an expert fail. It's definitely what, 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 what was the question? Like, uh, how many gumballs could fit in the Empire State Building or something like that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, there's, there's a family of that. They tend to get called uh, Fermi questions uh, okay. after, you know, uh, after the Fermi. Um, but, but the interesting thing is empirically, you know, th these are smart people, right? Uh, you know, the 90% confidence interval contained the true answer maybe 50, 60% of the time. Mm. And, and I think that's just normal. And so the big thing to drill is not, you know, it's not, oh, I need to get better at, you know, knowing things. It's, I need to know if I say I'm 90% confident or if I say I'm 50% confident, what does that mean? And, you know, it doesn't have to be a number, an equation, but intuitively knowing what those mean uh, matters a lot. And like, I think bridge and poker players, for example, will, will often be pretty good at this. Do you play any poker yourself? Uh, not these days. I, I played a little. I actually preferred bridge. Uh, I, I, I had the unfortunate thing of, you know, going to university where I did and then working where I did. Uh, the average standard of poker is quite high. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a tough crowd to. Uh, you know, I, I've to heard they against. have it at a couple other firms at uh, at Jane Street. Did they have mandatory poker nights? Uh, I don't think there was anything mandatory. There were definitely plenty of opportunities to, you know, to learn, <laughs> to play, to have fun. They were good. Uh, yeah, because it, it's the same type of thing, right? Like, uh, you know, trying to find an edge, right? Playing exactly. a game that has, you know, uh, like uh, some, an analogy I always gave to people, because you know how people would always say, you know, uh, trading is, it's like uh, playing against the casino or something like that, you know, mm. like that kind of an analogy. Yeah. And I, I say, slow down, slow down. You're not playing against a casino <laughs> because casino, you're playing against the house. It's more like a poker yeah. game where events are unfolding in the middle and you're betting against other people about what events are going to unfold. Yeah, you know, and, and <laughs> definitely. It's a very different game when you when you change that dynamic slightly, right? When you go from playing against a house that has the edge over you to playing against a game where you could have an edge over someone else. Yes. Right? Um, so, and, and then as for like uh, somebody who's, let's say an intermediate level trader in the retail mm -hmm. space, yes. you know, um, uh, let's say they're at a point where they, they're they thinking about expected value, things like that. Uh, they've got a good understanding of their product. They have, you know, they're, they're trying to take it really seriously. What, what advice yeah. would you have for someone in that stage? Uh, uh, you know, in terms of like where they should be looking for information or, you know, how to evaluate good and bad ideas, things that they should be adding yeah. to their knowledge base or discarding from what they consider. How should someone at that stage be thinking about the game? Yeah. 
So the first thing, and maybe this is cheating, is prioritization. Like think, try to really think about what it is you, you need to do next, because there's always going to be more improvements you can do, you know, more ideas you have, more pieces of information you could learn or research than you're ever gonna have time for. And like treating it as a real problem, you know, like what, what is the valuable thing to work on now? Which things am I going to accept being less good at? I, I think really accelerates uh, development. And then as a more concrete thing, probably being really careful about overfitting in, in all its guises. Uh, the, the world is, you know, this, this sort of unfriendly place. Uh, you know, one thing I do believe very strongly is it's very hard to make money trading. Markets are mostly efficient. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the default is they're efficient, it's hard to make money. So if you think you found a trade, you know, the bar should be relatively high. Obviously, it depends on costs. You know, if you're given the ability to do a trade for free, nah, sure, you know, whatever. No, yeah, um, you might have a bit of, well, that's an edge. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like, like really thinking and worrying about all the things you could have tried but didn't, you know. Mm. And one of the things I found at Jane Street is, well, firstly, a lot of studies done in sort of the broader world are just, uh, you know, kind of p-hacked, uh, are just horribly overfit, even through no fault of the authors. Um, so stop me if this is too much for tension, but one of the things I found really interesting from the machine learning field is you can get a situation where every individual author behaves entirely honestly. You know, they, they only did one test and they, you know, accurately, you know, they accurately say what the results were, you know, I don't know, was it significant at some confidence level, say? But if only the successful ones get published, the unsuccessful mm. ones, you know, go away, do something else, then as somebody reading one of these results, even if you know the authors themselves were entirely honest and diligent, you know, the literature as a whole is biased towards positive results and the confidences are, are overstated. You know, if, if 20 people, you know, test some, test some hypothesis, one of one of them randomly gets a, a false positive result. Mm -hmm. That one publishes a paper. You look at the literature, you see one published paper, but it happens to be Interesting. wrong. And I think exactly the same thing happens in trading. You know, we try and be very diligent about, say, how we do our back testing, about not overfitting. I assume by the point you're up to intermediate level, you know, you know that you need to hold some out of sample data, or you know, you know that you need to like actually test things going forwards. But knowing that even then, even though you're being so diligent, you might still be overstating things and just worrying about the implications of that, I would say, is a big one. It makes a lot of sense. Speaking of machine learning and all these things, um, one of the things that uh, retail trading is a very big community, right? Uh, like even, yeah. even at the you know, entry level uh, rank, like if you look at Robinhood, Right, Robinhood has 13 million registered mm. accounts, I believe. Right, it, it, so the trading is just an absolutely exploding industry in the retail space yeah. right now. And one of the things that uh, nobody wants to touch the topic of in the retail space is this whole quant mm. idea, this quant mystique that's out there, right? Where people, when they hear the word quant, they immediately jump to the idea of AI or ML um and, and and go not for me right what is your experience with the word quant bean and in your opinion what does that word mean <laughs> that's a great question i honestly don't have a good answer to what it means uh like actually at james street we deliberately stayed away from that word at least internally it, it's kind of like ML actually, in that it can mean all kinds of things. So if you go look up the, the definition of like machine learning on Wikipedia, you know, and, and read it diligently, you know, it, it includes linear regression, you know, it includes like, <laughs> yeah. you know, just, just fitting a beta model. Um, but people always assume when you say ML, oh, it, you know, assume fancy things. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
maybe this is stepping around the question a little, but I would say, don't add complexity for the sake of complexity. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I, I would actually 100% agree with that because I, I think that's the, 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 the most frustrating thing when trying to talk about a, a more evidence-driven approach to trading mm. is you immediately get lumped in with, you know, the cutting edge of technology. And like, if you're not a PhD in mathematics and 15 years in academics, you, you can't even touch the topic. It's like, no, no, slow yes. down, right? Slow down. Uh, and this is something that actually you and I spoke about just prior to this call, which is mm. that tons of edge can be found in simplicity, right? Yeah. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I, I really believe is that um, a lot of edge, it, it, it's actually right there a lot of the times. It's the monetization that's difficult, yeah. you know? Yes. Uh, um, but when it comes to like looking for ideas and um, things like that, what are your uh, opinions on qualitative versus quantitative approaches? And we'll, we'll discard of the idea of, you know, AI and these, uh, you yeah. know, deep learning models for now. We'll come to that. I, know you, yeah. I want to hear what you have to say <laughs> about that too. But let, let, let's put those to the side for now. And let's talk about, you know, uh, simple statistics and data science yeah. and uh, qualitative approaches. Um, let's talk about in there, uh, you know, qualitative research, right? Like what's actually happening out there when maybe looking at like, yeah. a, you know, a one-off situation, something like that. Or, and we'll also talk about things like, you know, uh, subjective technicals, you know, chart reading mm. and, um, you know, more human pattern recognition methodologies. So what are your thoughts yeah. on those sort of three categories and uh, overlaps, pros yeah. and cons? What do you think? Sure. So uh, I'll maybe start with technicals uh, and I hope I don't offend anyone here. I think there is a kernel of truth to a lot of it. You know, it wouldn't sort of still exist in, in the kind of consensus mind if it was like completely random noise. But I, my general experience has been that most people or most traders who you know, would say, oh, what I do is technicals, you know, who mean things like, oh, you know, I sort of look for a particular pattern on a chart. Certainly the majority of those I've spoken to have been basically kidding themselves. Uh, you know, which again is not to say that, that there isn't good ideas there. Right? I think you should absolutely take things from there. Um, but, you know, I would say, like, call, call this advice, if you will. I, I think if anyone, you know, thinks they're going to read a book of, like, chart patterns uh, and just make money by sort of looking for those patterns, uh, there, there's a lot of very subtle landmines. And, and I think it's a, you know, I think it's a dangerous way to go. Mm -hmm. um, but, but more broadly, my approach has always been, you know, to not try and be too exclusive. You know, my job's not to say, oh, I make money by doing quant stuff, I make money by doing qualitative stuff, you know, I make mm -hmm. money by using ideas from technical analysis, like a, a dollar is is a dollar. Uh, I lean more towards the quant side because that's where I have more experience, but I think there's a lot of edge actually at being able to integrate them. Like, how do you, like, how do you combine some rough qualitative sense that's hard to write down as a number with you know, the, the output of some quantitative model saying, you know, this thing's going to go up 10%. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's really good too. Uh, I, I know a few people who try to integrate the two. I typically lean more towards a, a quantitative side as well, but not so much just because like you're saying, uh, you know, I want it to be that way or I'm, you know, against the other yeah. way. A dollar is a dollar, right? Well, you know, yeah. like you said, it's, it's, it's a, uh, where do I think I can make money? Yeah. Right. And um, the, the the hard part for me, because so from, from my background, remember I was saying I, I came up the, the traditional retail route, mm. right? Where, uh, you know, technical analysis was certainly a part of my analysis for a very, very long time. Yeah. Um, it, it was the primary analysis and the only analysis for a very long time as well. Um, and the hard part was that I would win and think I was on the right track and then lose, or I'd lose, make a change and then win and think I'd made a, a progress, yeah. but I could never tell if I was just going in a circle. <laughs> and yeah. the hard part was because, uh, you know, I could never escape the subjectivity of it, which made it hard mm. to, you know, build something on it, right? It, it sort of yeah. felt like unstable ground to be building a house on. Uh, it was yeah. one of the challenges I always had. 
Yeah, and actually, I think to your you know to your point earlier of like maybe how how to think about choosing um, for any given idea, I'd say there's you should be as quantitative as the idea permits. You know, if you're talking about some phenomena that should happen every second of the day, every time the price moves, then you're, you know, that's the most studyable thing ever. You know, mm -hmm. If you're trying to do that trade without studying it, you're doing something very wrong. On the other hand, if you have some you know, idea, you've done some qualitative research, maybe you know, some company has had some weird thing in its earnings, maybe some weird geopolitical event has just happened in the world, you know, like it's almost by definition unstudyable, you know, yeah. N equals one, you know, you're being as quantitative as you can. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I get what I you're saying. can be interesting. Yeah. And, you know, um, there's a, a book that we recommend uh, our members to, to look at. Uh, it's called Evidence-Based Technical Analysis. Mm. And basically it's about can we quantify these things? And if we can, mm. then we can test them and then we can say, does this make money or not? Yeah. Right? Um, and obviously combined with the, why are we even studying this part, right? Because I, I think this is the, the thing that we're gonna get into right after this, which is the importance of creativity in trading and the mm. idea generation. Cause I actually think that's where the yeah. money's made, right? These are all, you know, being able to do simple statistics and stuff. I, 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 what are your thoughts on this? I, I view it as mm. just a requirement to play. And, and there is some yeah. art to the data manipulation as well. There's obviously art within the data science. Yeah. Um, I have to throw that in the, in there. Otherwise my business partner would kill me. Um, cause he, he's the more, uh, you know, he's a serious data science guy. Um, but there's also the whole idea generation thing, right? Like being able to look out at the market and notice something yeah, and be able to ask a question, a, a better question than someone else and then come up with an answer. Um, so why, why don't we just jump into that? Uh, one of the things that you'd said to me, uh, in our little, like uh, prep before mm. this, was that uh, you felt that all of the different life experiences that you've had and you know go out of your way to have uh, give you more to work with in a sense and like yeah. have helped you in your career. And there's actually a quote from Steve Jobs, I believe, that I really, really like. Because uh, I've done sort of a similar thing where I've tried a bunch of different things mm. and tried to stay open to different ideas, right? Uh, hence the whole... Uh, you know, when we met, I did that talk about all the books I'd read that one year. Yeah. Um, and they're sort of in the same line, you know, from the coming from the same place where so Steve Jobs said uh, more, uh, you know, creative people aren't necessarily creating new ideas out of thin air. Uh, creative people, you can think of creativity as being able to connect dots mm. and creative people just have more dots to connect. So they have more life experiences. Yeah. They've traveled more. They've listened to more music. They've talked to different people. And because they've done all these things, they have all these more nodes that could be connected. And by having that, they come up with things that other people who have less nodes can't come up with. What, what are your thoughts yeah. on that? And do you see that sort of concept applying in your trading in any way? Um, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I mean, very much so. Uh, so to, to give one example, you know, like, Probably this matters less for retail, but for the say institutional firms doing trading, speed matters. Uh, and you know, but then even as you back away from say so-called high frequency trading, there's still a bunch of things where the sheer scale matters. You know, the, there's a lot of stocks in the world. It turns out <laughs> there's even more derivatives. <laughs> there's a ton of options. So you know even just to operate at human time scales, at that scale, speed matters. Uh, and, you know, one of the sort of more oddball things I did back in kind of high school university uh, was I did a bunch of embedded development on microcontrollers, you know, sort of, you know, tiny, you know, you know your, your computer's this 64-bit processor that can do, you know, three billion cycles a second, and each mm -hmm. of those cycles might be multiple instructions. You know, tiny, microprocessor that's running 8-bit instructions, you've got like three registers, like there's literally three bytes you can store data in that you're allowed to do operations on. And maybe you've got like 256 bytes to like store more code. But you do that and, and you understand what's going on. And, and it, you know, it gave me this appreciation at a much lower level. So fast forward many years, like a lot of things just become very intuitive in terms of say, 
seeing how you could make something faster or more precisely how to make something not slow. Um, so, so that matters or, you know, to throw a completely different one out there, the kind of some amount of background in say physics, uh, you know, physics and radio and understanding trade-offs and limitations there, these days it's all fairly well known anyway, but you know, like having that intuitive sense for, oh, I could kind of look at a map and, you know, interpret what a speed means in terms of distance, or maybe turn it around. Maybe you see things happening in the market with some timing, like realizing that that means you know, that timing implies a distance. You can start inferring things about, you know, who it is, who's using what, um, you know, kind of basically understand what's going on in the world, what's going on in the trading uh, in a much more fine-grained way than you might if, you know, you, you didn't have the, this idea. So, so there's sort of two very different things in my background that, that I think have kind of helped me there. Brilliant. And... You know, the, the thing that I think about uh, with you sharing that is uh, information speed and, uh, you know, how quickly things move. This was actually something that Augustine talked about when we had that meeting as well. His whole presentation mm, was on yes. how unbelievably fast and the, the, the development of information movement over the last like yes. 100 years has been and its impacts on the financial world. And, yeah. you know, something that I, I, I'm thinking about now is as a, as a you know, most of our audience is retail, either yeah. looking to do their own thing or looking to eventually make the leap into like a vol fund or something of that nature. Yeah. Um, you know, that seems like a very daunting thing to overcome. Um, have you ever seen the documentary Inside the Black Box? I haven't actually. It's a, it's an interesting one about what goes on at these high frequency firms and stuff. Mm. And I watched it and I remember being traumatized after like, how am I ever going to make money here? <laughs> and yeah. uh, no, because it's, it's a real phenomenon, like how quickly this information moves around. Mm. And, um, you know, as, as a retail trader, that's definitely like a, not the space to compete probably. Yeah. Just because I would say there's two disadvantages in retail right now, which is uh, technology and to some extent information. Yeah, access to certain types of information. Um, so in that sort of space, right, you know, being someone who's, yeah. let's say, learned some basic data science and, you know, uh, can pull in some data, do these types of things. What should retail focus on? Mm. Right. If so, you know, I'm not, you know, let's say I have a hundred thousand dollar account, right. Uh, yeah. You know, um, so I'm not trying to turn a hundred dollars <laughs> into a million dollars. I've got enough that I can sort yeah. of you know, play the game properly to some extent. Yeah. Um, where, where should I spend my time like looking, right? I, I want yeah. to find an edge. What, what should I look for? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So starting at the more meta level, right? Like look for where you think other people aren't looking. So, you know, like as retail or frankly, as most institutions, there's no point at all trying to do oh, you know, I'm going to do an arbitrage between SPY and, you know, the, the SPY ETF in New York yeah. and uh, the futures in Chicago, right? There, there's no point at all. So don't bother trying. You can still use that information. Though. Like an interesting consequence of this is, well, any information, let's say you're, you're in New York, let's say you're an equity trader, any information that's coming from Chicago, like is reflected in the price of the spider ETF in New York before you get to see it hmm. come from Chicago. So, uh, you know, maybe that doesn't matter. You know, that timing is not going to matter much unless you're at least an institution. But that principle. But I think, yeah, the, the principle generalizes, right? Like if, if for some type of information and at some time scale, you know there are people out there that are just faster than you, then fine, let them move that information and take advantage of that moved information to you know, find something else you can do. Uh, and then I would say the, the sort of fills into the next principle of these big firms, they don't have infinite capacity. You know, they are having to prioritize as well. So again, you know, don't go looking for a trade which is obviously worth it for them. But on the other hand, if you're retail, say with a with a hundred thousand dollar account, there's a load of trades that you know are real money to you 
that the aren't worth the time of day to the to the citadels mm-hmm. of the world to to you know the giant hedge funds or to the Jane streets um you know go go looking for those trades yeah that's the, that's what I, I I never understood when someone would say like I only follow blue chips I'm like why <laughs> yeah <laughs> what yeah. are you doing this go look where yeah. you know like uh, you don't need to be a uh, don't try to be the guppy in the ocean, you know, be the yeah. guppy with the tadpoles, go find the even smaller <laughs> fish than you and that you can, you know, get some food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Like another one that uh, we, we have spent some time looking into is, uh, you know, one of the edges we think retail have is uh, risk tolerance. You don't mm-hmm. have a, you can embrace more variance because you don't have a, a risk manager breathing down your shoulder, cutting your capital if you have a 5% drawdown. Right. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts on something like that being an edge for retail? Yeah, I think there is a spectrum of risk tolerances within, let's say, the institutional players. I also think it, it's you know, simplifying risk just kind of this this one dimensional thing is doesn't quite portray how people think about it. Like there's kind of variance, mm-hmm. you know, which I'll say, like, let's say small percentage drawdowns. There's also, you know, what many in the industry would you know, think about in terms of tail risk, like the risk of, you know, losing everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly maybe, say, hedge funds and proprietary traders might think about that one a little differently. Uh, you know, the, the implied yeah. badness is different. Um, but yeah, like certainly as retail, you're, you're maybe in a position to accept variance. You're also maybe in a position to you know, accept risks that, are unacceptable to others you know like if if like let let's say you know you you happen to know that in the space in which you're working you know lots of the institutional players have like a five percent or a ten percent drawdown limit explicit or implicit you know you're going to see all kinds of weirdness happen around that boundary right you know the Mm. sort of the price of insurance say through options yeah. that you know keeps you to just inside that last this is just outside is going to start looking very different and maybe if you're retail you're, you're equally happy to to you know bear that or, or to pick another yeah. one you know in say fixed income lots of funds not so much like prop traders and and not even so much hedge funds but lots of institutional funds have a mandate to only invest in you know corporate bonds right non-high mm-hmm. yield bonds so, you know, if you as an individual don't care, you know, don't care about this like arbitrarily fine dividing line, or maybe if you as an individual don't care so much about, you know, whether it just fell out of this magical, you know, investment grade status or not, there's potentially going to be opportunities there. And, and I believe there's a bunch of results in the literature to the effect where, you know, the, right, you, you take like the best rated high yield bonds, and the worst rated investment grade bonds. And like in actual credit risk terms, they're basically the same, but the high yield ones are a bunch cheaper. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I, uh, okay, I, I, wanna, I wanna pivot a little bit here. I, I had another thing I wanted Correct. to ask you about. Um, and th- this is gonna uh, bleed into a couple other things we'll be able to talk about too. Uh, so when you worked at Jane Street, how, much of your time was spent uh, discretionary or systematic on, uh, you know, developed strategies or, or developing mm-hmm. new strategies that, uh, you know, captured some sort of like risk premium or like were repeatable things, things that occurred at certain intervals or something of that nature yep. versus how much of your time or, or would they even look at events that were like one-off, maybe like distressed events where the market, uh, you know, takes a huge hit or a particular asset class takes a huge hit or some sort of uh, one-off discretionary event happens. How yeah. does a firm of the size of Jane Street address these two different things? Uh, and, and then if, if they do look at these one-off things, what's the sort of process uh, that someone would go through to, to evaluate something like this? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So let's say for me, Probably like I don't know, ninety-eight percent of my time was on, you know, repeatable things, uh, but the, there was variation. It, indeed, mm-hmm. you know, 
with a firm of that size, you know, there are some people who say speciality is is maybe closer to thinking about rarer or, or more unusual events. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, like I, in terms of process, I wouldn't say there was like a, you know, I don't think there's one particular magical process. Like in, in some sense, the definition of a one-off event can almost be, you know, the, there's no nice sort of, you know, standard framework in which to put it in. Because mm -hmm. if there was, well, maybe you should think of it as belonging to like, you know, that, yeah. that class of events <laughs> and study them as a whole. Just a bigger time uh, frame. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the most interesting ones are the most unique, the, the things which have never, you know, happened before or or very, very rarely. Uh, but in terms of things, you know, we would want to think about in terms of things that are good to think about, you know, you going back to what was said earlier, you really do have to just think about, okay, what do I know? What do I think other people know? Why do I have edge? So, mm -hmm. so the, the most important question is articulating why you think you've seen some edge that the rest of the world hasn't. Yeah, or maybe like, why are certain people acting in certain ways? And is there something there I can take advantage of? Uh, you know, reason I bring that up is, you know, a couple of events that have happened recently, right? Uh, if we look at uh, everything happening in China, right? You had the originally, like one, one of the ones that came up was um, uh, the, the Archegos Fund that blew up. Right? Yeah. And, and so, you know, that was one event that we, we were in a position around. Um, and then more recently, uh, with all the, the government crackdowns over there, mm. the hit to the education tech sector and, and things of that nature. Um, if we were to use that as an example, right? And, and somebody was like, well, you know, it's like whenever there's chaos, things become a little less efficient, you know? And there, there's yeah. definitely some room uh, to make some, somebody's going to come out of this making money. I should, yeah. you know, if I wanted to take my stab at trying to find the way to look, let's say uh, institution or retail level, how would someone go about approaching a situation like this? Yeah, uh, great question again. Uh, I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know. So yeah, I guess like thinking through, you know, my thought process maybe. Uh, yeah. Part of it is what are the, what are the simplest things? You know, like speaking personally, knowing my skills, I'm not, the best person at like understanding geopolitics. I, I don't think I'm completely useless, but you know, take me in a room full of random traders. I suspect the random traders are better than I am at like, you know, <laughs> uh, sort of thinking about what, what some treaty means or, or what's happening diplomatically. Yeah. So, so I'm not going to spend my time trying to look for those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the first thing I'm going to look at is like how, how distress is it you know how disorderly is the market uh because you know maybe some of the easiest edges are just where various participants are no longer taking part you know i don't know if you know take say the i guess this is a different event so i'm cheating but like the quant fund meltdown of you know well you can take your pick now uh yeah. there's been a few <laughs> you know like almost by definition like not only are, are those funds having problems but a lot of the other funds are going to be similar funds will be having problems doing similar trades, right? Their, you know, their, their brokers, their risk managers are going to be a bit nervous about yeah, what's going margin on. Margin requirements are going to be jacked up. Things will be different. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but like the, the core things they're doing probably still make sense. You know, it, it's not to the extent that those ideas are sort of fundamental ideas about the world. You know, there are still going to be trades there that work that maybe previously were very hard to make money doing. That, that if you were, mm -hmm. you know, retail or, or you know, someone not, not especially good at that, you wouldn't be able to. Now, maybe those trades become good again. So, so one of the first things I'm going to do is like look at, you know, look at all kinds of like what, what, what facts about the world do I believe that are normally competed away that maybe are no longer being competed away. Okay, we've done we've, that, that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, but we've done a lot of talking about hypothetical trades here. So I, I got to yeah. ask. Uh, you know, I feel like this is a question that never gets asked on trading podcasts for some <laughs> reason. But it's just generally do you, tell tell us a trading story, right? Tell us, uh, you know, if you can, right? If you're not yeah. uh, under some crazy NDA where you can't say <laughs> anything, you know, tell us a story, like uh, yeah. so maybe a moment you were a part of historically, or like uh, you know 
something that really stood out to you, like something you were really proud of maybe, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, something like a, in, in one of Yoon Sinclair's books, he does this trade breakdown where he like goes step by step each day, like how he managed this position and stuff, the idea generation, everything. Mm. And it's just, you know, it was very eye opening for me and, and a bunch of other people. And uh, so I would love to pass that question on to you and ask, tell us a story. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so probably one of the ones which I guess kind of sticks in my memory a lot, uh, partially because I was maybe, you know, less experienced at the time that I would subsequently become. Everything's more exciting when you're new. Yeah. Uh, was, I forget exactly when it was, uh, but, but the Swiss franc used to be de facto pegged to the euro. You know, it, it, it was technically a one-sided peg, but it, it was pegged to the euro. I, I think the rate was like being held at like 1.3 or something. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's funny which details remain salient in your mind. <laughs> um, and one day, completely out of the blue, you know, the Swiss National Bank announced they're not holding that peg anymore. You know, it's it's going to free float. And in a matter of, you know, basically seconds, you know, the, the Swiss franc had moved like north of 10% oh against the euro. And, and, you know, like that, like that, that's a huge event, you know, that that's in the realm of the famous quote, you know, 10 Sigma events don't happen. Yeah. Like, it, you know, even for a normal currency, that's huge. And this is additionally something that's been basically fixed, you know, probably half yeah. the world's like put in their models, just the hard code. Oh, you know, it's Swiss franc. It's like, yeah, you know, it doesn't move. Euros. <laughs> yeah, um, it, yeah. And those who didn't, you know, well, like what, what's its volatility? Can, yeah. The volatility of it seems to be like zero. Um, yeah. It's one, 1% 1 annualized. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. so, so you simultaneously had two really interesting things happen. You know, the, the first is even just the, the futures or different locations you could trade it, like, you know, this, this is in some sense an easy arbitrage, mm -hmm. um, like suddenly broke down. And there's all yeah. kinds of reasons. Like, honestly, like I think a lot of people had technical problems, either due to, you know, sudden loads on various connections or just due to, you know, various things being tripped. Like a lot mm -hmm. of very prudent things would have your automated systems trip off if some fundamental assumption of the world is violated. Um, yeah. And, and, and indeed, even for us, like we, you know, uh, many of the automated systems were for various reasons unable to basically work in, in, in the aftermath of that. Uh, and so there was suddenly, you know, you're talking like one of the most liquid efficient arbitrages in the world. And there's suddenly an opportunity to do it literally by hand through a manual order entry system. Um, wow. You know, like it, it's obviously terrifying. You know, everything's moving a lot. You know, all your sort of intuitions built up are hard. But like, you know, really sort of thinking about that, focusing on that, you know, doing that was, you know, actually pretty valuable. Like, and moreover, like in some sense, I think it helps make the world better. You know, like like in regular times, you can have a lot of argument over, like, you know. Do market makers actually add real liquidity, et cetera? Um, you know, but, but at a time like that, it's very clear that sitting there being, you know, the person left entering manual orders, trying to keep these things roughly in line with each other, you know, you, you really are helping the, the financial system function. Yeah. And the, on the flip side of that, too, is, you know, for providing that service, you get compensated pretty handsomely for it, right? Yeah. And, you know, but, but so this is one of the things uh, I'd love to get your opinion on. Um, one of the things we always talk to uh, about with, with our, with our group of traders is you, know, you, you don't scale to like an arbitrary number of your account, right? Like, let's say like the 1% mm. rule, I only bet 1% of my account. What you should do is scale to your edge, right? Mm. You know, because otherwise you may not be allocating your capital efficiently, right? You know, it wouldn't make sense to have yeah. an arbitrage and bet 1% of your capital. So yeah. how did it feel? Because I assume you were, you were betting bigger or really big on these yes. events, right? P allocating, yeah. you know, putting the keys on the table almost in a situation like this. <laughs> and how did it feel doing that? How did you know that that was the right move if you did do that? Like walk us through what how yeah. that actually played out and, and the 
the actual emotions behind it and the decision making that went into mm. taking this big bet. Yeah. So, you know, one of the nice things about getting to work with people, um, and this is why you know, I would suggest for like trading on your own is tough. Like I would strongly suggest for any retail, like find, you know, find a buddy or, or someone you, you can at least talk things through. Um, you know, the, the first moments are the most speed sensitive. You're not yet up to the most terrifying sizes. You know, you're pretty much just acting unilaterally. Um, but as, you know, seconds pass, there's maybe seconds turn into tens of seconds into minutes. There's now time for a bit more communication and coordination. So, you know, some people on the desk are like, you know, really trying to find any more information about what's going on. You know, like in the immediate aftermath, you've maybe not even seen the headlight yet. You, you know, you might not even know what's caused it. So people starting to try and, you know, a few people trying to understand what's going on. You know, a few people might be looking at what our, you know, what our positions actually are, you know, making sure the trades are going through, looking for signs of problem there. You know, you've probably got at least one person just helping sanity check the price. It's like, look at the trades you have already done. You know, have they been making money? Um, as this very, very crude sanity check is if you're doing arbitrage, they, yeah. they should be good. Exactly. Um, and, and then just also starting to bring in, you know, senior experience people, you know, to into the discussion about how big to go, uh, you know, once we're starting to go to the like, oh, this is maybe now material to, to the firm, you know, obviously you want to start bringing in, in more people. Or, and indeed, later in my career at Jane Street, I, I actually ended up spending an increasing amount of my time in that kind of risk role of sort of, you know, thinking about, about risk. And it's, it's always a really hard and scary question. I mean, frankly, if you're not scared, uh, you probably shouldn't be making those decisions. Yeah, exactly. Right. I was going to say, if, if you're, if you're not scared, that doesn't, that means you don't care enough. You need to bet more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting pretty close to the end here to, to wrap it up. Do you have any advice that you would like to just generally share with uh, whoever is going to end up listening to this podcast? Uh, you know, I, I would say most people who will end up around here, just to give you some context on, on the, the listener a little more. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, probably taking the game pretty seriously. You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're exploring these more quantitative ideas. They may want to do this full time or, uh, you know, they are, they are willing to go the extra mile in terms of the reading, in terms of everything. You know, somebody who's a, a, uh, just trying to absorb as much as they can, what would you yeah. tell that person to, to make, help them make sure they're on the right path moving forward? Yeah. Probably the shortest version is reading is no is no substitute for doing. You know, like you you will never become a great trader just by sitting down and reading lots of books. Like all kinds of skills matter when you do it, especially anything you're doing in the moment. And you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make lots of mistakes. You know, accept that up front. Kind of budget for those mistakes. You know, <laughs> budget so they're not going to wipe you out and just make sure you learn from them. And, and you know, like paper trading is one thing. I, I think there are lots of dynamics there that these days with like, you know, various cheap fees and sort of relative ease of trading small sizes, I really would push in the direction of, you know, if you're going to do it, if you think you have some idea, then do it for, for some size. You know, small, but do it. I 100% agree with that. I think that's amazing advice. So let's say someone's taken that advice and now they're doing it. Uh, what should they be doing to evaluate their progress? Right, because you know it's one of those things where in the uh, you know there's there's a a million ideas out there. There's a million opinions out there. 99% of them you shouldn't listen to, and 1% maybe you should. But you know, being able to tell the 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 good from the bad is not necessarily always the clearest picture in the world. So how can someone who's taken ideas, developed their own maybe, and they're now implementing, right? Obviously, are you making money is one metric. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's things like, for example, you could go out and just sell Delta 10 strangles and mm. it'll look like, you know, you're making money. Yeah. You know, if, if all you're looking at is the trade you put on today, you're probably making yeah. money. 
right? So how can you evaluate yourself and, and, and not, you know, fall into any sort of bias or, mm. uh, you know, these traps that when you do scale up might, might come back to, to haunt you? How can you keep yourself yeah. on the straight and narrow? Yeah. I, yeah, I think that that's really important, Sean. Uh, skew, like worrying about skew and worrying about fat tails, I would say, are the biggest things. Yeah. So, so by skew, I mean, you know, your, your trade has the property where the typical losses are going to be bigger than the typical wins. Um, and you know, by fat tails, I basically mean, you know, the world is not a normal distribution, despite what uh, you know, some academics might suggest, and understanding the, the possibility for, you know, like once you're talking something fairly unlikely, it, who, who knows where, where it can end. But uh, the fat tails matter for risk, but, but skews what really matters for your evaluation. Right. If you can normally have a decent sense for how skewed something is by like thinking about it, thinking about what you're doing. If you're selling these, you know, 10 delta baby options, you know, you, you know you've got skew. Uh, yeah. Heck, if you're running a market making strategy, you know you've got skew against you. Um, but there are strategies that don't. You know, if your strategy doesn't have skew, that, that's great. It makes evaluation easy. If, if your strategy does have skew, you know, then you need to think about how frequent the losses are. Like, how much data do you need to expect to see at least a few of the losses happen to get mm. a better sense for how big they are? And often this forces you into back testing, but you know, it, yeah, yeah. But thinking about that empowers you empowers you a lot. It tells you what you need. I think. Brilliant. Okay, Craig. That was. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure getting to cool. chat with you. This was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks again for having me, Sean.